Welcome to Doctors at Work. My name is Matt Daniel and this podcast is about doctors' careers. Today I'm having a conversation with Simon Craig and we're talking about how to create great teams. Now we all work within teams, but what makes one team great and another one less so? All of us instinctively know it feels a certain way. In this episode, Simon tells me about teamwork and we talk about culture. Now, he's written a book called From Hurting to Healing, in which he explores how we can change medicine for the better. He tells me about the importance of belonging, leadership and cake. And his top tip for doctors would be to really invest in high quality connections. Welcome, Simon. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, So I'm an Australian uh, doctor. I specialised in obstetrics and gynaecology, and uh, I've done that for many years and loved that. And I've had a a career change and moving into some different areas now. It's a very exciting career journey, and I, I invited you to talk because you wrote a book. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I wrote a book uh, called From Hurting to Healing, Delivering Love to Medicine and Healthcare. And uh, the, 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 the reason the book came about was because towards the end of my clinical career, I was thinking more about different issues. I was thinking about the struggles we had in healthcare, uh, cultural uh, burnout, these types of things, and also what, what we could do about it. And I was particularly interested in teams. I've always been uh, interested in teams in every realm, sports, music, whatever it is. And uh, it struck me that some teams in my organisation and many other organisations were fantastic high-functioning teams and others with similar backgrounds were not performing well and having lots of issues. And it, it's hard to, to know why that would be. And I thought, what are the elements that create high-functioning teams? And I didn't know what they were necessarily. I had an intuition. And if we could identify what these elements were, why weren't we trying to uh, put those elements into play with every particular team? Uh, So I went off and, and, and was getting a bit interested in these questions and couldn't find the answers. And so my sort of journey to look for these answers and how we could improve things uh, led to the book. And actually, I really enjoyed um, the book, the aspect around teams, but there are multiple layers in the book because there's lots of stuff there about individuals and individual burnout and how people are defining success. And that that sort of struck me as really useful for the individual as well as that team and team working level. And also I know that in the book you talk a lot about culture um, and how culture develops and how all of us influence culture. And maybe let, let's talk about teams then, first of all. And what do we know about teamwork in healthcare settings? Well, we know that um, high functioning teams and effective teams are essential for healthcare. We all we all intuitively know this. We know that patient outcomes, there's evidence that patient outcomes are better with with good teams. We know that well-being in the members of the team is higher. We know that the organization flourishes on every every parameter, every measure. So teams are are really essential. I think we perhaps don't do teams as well as we used to. Uh, I think uh, perhaps there's a little bit more um, sort of separation from the leaders and the juniors. Maybe there's a little bit more competition. Perhaps our relationships and our communication have slipped a little bit, but... uh, Quite often we don't we don't have the teams that we'd like to be in, and we all know when we're part of a great team. Um, it just feels good. It's great, and and we remember those teams from the past, don't we? We remember when we were a junior resident and having an amazing leader. It it and it's a, a, such a beautiful memory. What what goes into a really good team? Well. I think there's a lot of factors and they mostly come down to human interaction, I think. It's it's much less about the technical and more about the person to person. And I think back on when I've learned technical skills or when I've learned obstetric skills and things. And I, and I, I remember less about who taught me the skills, but I remember more about 
how I felt in certain teams and how I felt with leaders. And perhaps even when you think you've made a mistake or when something hasn't gone as well, how you were treated in that team, maybe how quickly you were integrated into that team, how quickly the, the, the very senior professor knew your name rather than you being the intern or the resident. You know, these sorts of things, how, how quickly you feel you belong. Uh, and I, I saw something of yours the other day that you were talking about leaving work early and there were two of your juniors there and you were going off to have lunch or something unwork related and you wondered whether to tell them the truth and you did and I thought that's fantastic because that's that's honesty and that's integrity and that's there's some of the elements that the juniors model on us seniors so uh, that's how our teams will develop. I think that's going to be my mission, Simon, that by the time that I retire, we're all going to go out to lunch more. And, and that, <laughs> that way I'm, I'm going to know that I've achieved when we're all going out for lunch at least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a good, good team. OK, so so let's think then. So I've got a new person that's coming and joining the team that I work with. So to let, for me, that might be theatre team. For somebody else, it might be a ward multidisciplinary team. So, so what, what can the team members do to integrate a new person as quickly as possible? Well, firstly, that thought, what can we do to integrate them, is probably, or you're already ahead of, ahead of the game, I think, because you're thinking of the other person and what they can provide to, to you and what you can provide to them. And I think actually saying that out loud, because everyone, no matter how junior, they do bring things to the team. They might bring, uh, you know, they're filling gaps in the on-call roster. They're, they're chasing up results. They might be doing the, 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 the seemingly least important uh, roles, but they're critical roles. And, and, I think that has to be uh, recognised and discussed. And I was in, I was thinking about this the other day because I was watching, um, this is a little bit off topic, but I was watching Peter Jackson's uh, video about Get Back, about the Beatles album, you know, recording the Beatles album. And uh, John and Paul were the stars, of course, and George, and Ringo was kind of the other guy. But when you watch that, Ringo's the glue. He's the guy going around making the relationships and keeping everyone happy and having a joke. So he's not the, the genius, but he, he was providing such an essential function in that team. Okay. Or maybe he was the genius because he was the one yeah. that actually, the, the, maybe that, that was the function of genius is to bring people together, isn't it? And perhaps maybe as a society, that isn't a function that we value because we, we value all of the individual superheroes, don't we? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a great comment, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the, it's good to start of thinking, how can we integrate um, this person? Have, have you got some examples maybe from, from your own past as to when you were integrated really well or when you've seen it done really well and maybe times when you've seen it done not so well? I remember a time um, I joined a, a, a ward, a unit, an obstetric unit, and uh, I'd worked in the unit for a week. And on the Friday was our, our antenatal clinic. And uh, as we're working in this massively chaotic antenatal clinic, uh, which most antenatal clinics are, I'm not sure if you've been in one, and a, a message came over the loudspeaker saying, can all staff report to the meeting room? And, and we all went into this little meeting room and the most senior consultant came in with two thermos flasks of boiling water from home. And he made us all a cup of tea or coffee and it was a tea bag or a spoonful of Nescafe in those days. And so he, and we had sat around, and so he and the other senior consultant were kind of serving everyone. And then someone had brought in a cake. There was a cake roster. And so they cut that up and that's, you know, divided it out. And then the senior consultant said to me, hey, Simon, how about you bring the cake next week? And he said, None of that health food rubbish, no seeds or nuts. We want chocolate. And 
this was my first day with all these people really in it as a group and he was integrating me he was making me feel I was part of it straight away plus he was also getting some chocolate cake out of the <laughs> out of the deal but things like that bringing people in making them feel like they're part of the team so I'm wondering because you see because if, if, if that was the team that I work with I would say nothing with sugar and chocolate definitely no cake I, I want seeds and nuts and possibly some dates that might that might be the most sugary <laughs> As we go. So what you're saying, Simon, is that I need to forget the seeds and the nuts and I just need to bring in cake. So I think um, that's <laughs> right. I think the world's changed in what we what we think a good cake is. But uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, bringing the cake in, having a cake roster is a pretty powerful thing for a team, I think. Uh, so if somebody's going to say, I can't possibly justify taking 10 minutes out in the middle of a busy antenatal clinic. What would you say to that person? I'd say that that's, you know, a stitch in time. I think that the, the way you create those relationships and the way you know those people, that then uh, the junior consultant, the, the junior resident rings the consultant immediately. You know who they are. You know, you don't have, you, you, there's a degree of trust. You're, you're creating communication channels that ultimately are for the benefit of the patient. And, and also... I guess empowering people so that they aren't scared. You're that you become a person as the consultant rather than some scary figure. So things don't get hidden because a lot of our serious mistakes, serious errors in medicine, there's lots and lots of errors. And quite often that relates to a communication error. So we don't want a communication error that's come from fear. I think one of the challenges that the that, that certainly I experience in relation to those connections is that um, the way that the workloads are structured, certainly I spend very, very little time with, with sort of our foundation doctors, house officers, you know, people that are within the first few years. You know, there's a registrar that I spend a lot of time with, but people that are maybe within the first four years of the postgraduate training, the way the work is structured, um, very rarely see them and that's that's not because i don't want to it's just that the way the work is structured so um i guess sort of so that might be a slightly bigger question because i know in, in you know in your work you talk about the overall culture um and if i wanted to change how we work what can i as an individual do i think the the biggest change that we can make in that a team environment is how we show up and how we uh, behave and uh, the values that we we show to our juniors, uh, the efforts we make to get to know each other, uh, the way we communicate. Um, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be uh, just, it, it, it's, it's got to be authentic and it's, it's got to be serious. This is important work, but we can, have good relationships and we can like each other and we can be kind to each other uh, in in a very important field. Mm -hmm. And I also liked your comment earlier about the that that you know the professor was serving others. Um, so I wonder if you could can you tell me a bit about sort of there you are that's there's the leader the senior person that is serving others. You know what what does that say? What message does that send? Yeah, it, it sort of implies, it implies a, a little bit more equality, doesn't it? That we're all, and we are, we're all individuals, we're all people. We might have different training and different um, expertise and backgrounds, but at the, the root of it, we can all enjoy a cup of tea together and a chat and uh, and perhaps medicine particularly, uh, it's incredibly hierarchical. And, uh, and it's incredibly conservative. And that's been a good system. That's been a, a functional system to have that hierarchy and people with expertise, um, you know, expanding that downwards. Uh, it can, the benefits can sometimes, uh, it can change, the balance can change and it be, can become too rigid and, and too scary for those at the junior level. And what, why is that hierarchy a problem? 
I think when it any it becomes too rigid, and and the the leadership is is such a vertical leadership, it becomes decision making becomes a lot more slower uh, uh, slower. So a more horizontal style, for example. Uh, military leaders, you know, if you're the, the general and you're sitting in, let's say, Washington and there's people on the ground in Afghanistan, they're going to have to make decisions real time. It can't all go back to the general uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's delayed. And I guess similarly in healthcare, there are things that your residents, Matt, or your registrars will have to do without running every single decision past you. And if they're scared or they think this is such a rigid team, everything's got to go through Matt, treatments will be delayed and, and, and things will be slower and, and that will lead to a less functional team and perhaps the lesser outcomes for that team's patients. So I'm wondering that, that in some circumstances, they'll think there'll be some trainees who might say, oh, this is great that sort of, you know, I talk to the boss about everything. This is fantastic, yeah. But there are going to be others that are going to be immensely frustrated that um, that they're not being trusted or enabled to do everything. Um, and I guess equally, there's going to be some senior doctors who are going to be very micromanaging, who are going to say, I want to know everything about every one of my patients. Um, and there will be others who are kind of say, well, just get on with things. Um, yeah. And there's, there's, there's sort of the different the different permutations. So I'm wondering if there are if there are some trainees that that like to run everything past their boss, um, and you know that may be hierarchy related, which is which is bad. Um, but I guess also for some of them, they they might lack confidence. They might not trust themselves. Which actually that's also bad, isn't it? So whichever way we look at it, it's bad. Yeah. There needs to be an appropriate amount of discussion, not too much, not too little. Yeah. And maybe that's the key. Maybe there has to be discussion between the consultant and the registrar or the resident. And maybe that uh, a, a degree of self-awareness, if you know you're the consultant that gets anxious and wants to micromanage, you can say that. You can say it's not about you, it's about me. Uh, or, uh, you know, if you're a less, of, more of a hands-off consultant, you may... Uh, may discuss that, but say, but you know, it's always fine to ring me about things you're worried about. Um, I remember having a senior registrar who basically completed their training and was working in our team. And um, she wanted a lot of help, but it wasn't from lack of confidence. She just said, look, the more I interact with the consultants, with, with them assisting me or whatever it is, things I can do, but I'll be a consultant soon and I'll be on my own making. So I may as well suck up every little bit of knowledge I can at this moment. I thought that was a fantastic comment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good reason for discussing things, isn't it? A, re a genuinely good reason, that, that kind of learning mindset. Yeah. I'm reminded of um, when I was a trainee, I, I, I rotated between two um, consultants that were my trainers at the time. And, and one person was very hands off and I remember when it came to operating they kind of sort of say well you know you get on with things so I'd kind of struggle along you know from 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 9 till 11 50 and then he would come at 11 50 and in 10 minutes it would all be finished no matter how far or or not I had gotten 10 minutes later it, it would all be finished so that was great because it enabled me to make progress and clearly he trusted me and he let me do stuff and he knew that he could bail me out um, but I, I never really progressed. I kind of, I got stuck at a point and then my training didn't progress beyond that. Um, the other half of the firm was a consultant that very closely watched what you did and sort of and sat with you. And, you know, for that person, sometimes I found that frustrating and I thought, just leave me to it. I can do this bit, you know, let, let me do what I can do. But the plus was when I got stuck, they were there to say, oh, this is what you do, this is what you do. They moved me forwards and then I did a bit more and we operated together. So so it was it was a good learning experience at the point when I got stuck, even though up to that point of getting stuck, I, I found it quite frustrating that I wasn't let to, to let um, I wasn't allowed to do stuff. But between the two of them, I thought this was a perfect mix because you yeah, know, between yeah. the two of between the two of them, they were the perfect training firm. Yeah. It does sound like that, doesn't it? Very complimentary. I wonder if they knew that they had that uh, that relationship. 
Um, I don't know, I might ask them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll still talk to them both. Oh, great. Yeah, I suspect, I suspect at least one of them, I think, did, yeah. So to pro probably yeah. the, the one that sat with me, that that's probably the one that noticed and pay attention. The other one that left yeah. me probably didn't notice what, what was going on. That would be my guess. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Let's, let's go back sort of to, to teams then. So we talked about how somebody's new to the team. How can we get them introduced and how, how can we try and get them to be part of a team as quickly as possible? But what, from, from your experiences or from your research or the stuff that you've done um, for, for your book, what, what else distinguishes a team that's working well from a team that isn't? Uh, well, I think... Uh... The, the the sort of creation of belonging and the induction process that you just alluded to is is absolutely essential uh i think well we have markers don't we we have clinical markers that we know teams and we can compare ourselves to other teams both within our organization other organizations other countries so we have those sort of clinical markers for what they're worth bearing in mind that every population and every you know has different demographics each um, catchment area might be you might have more difficult uh, medical problems so we have that and i think we do know i think sometimes that data really is hard to to, to work out how do you define an optimal team and this is a thing a little bit like culture, in my opinion, Matt, that a lot of it's intuitive. You you will know when you're part of a good team and others will know. How do you measure that? Is it just on clinical data or is it on other things that are harder to, you know, there's subjective things. How do you objectively measure those things? How do you measure Matt's relationship with his registrar as opposed to the, the next consultant? How do you measure the amount of happiness? How do you measure what you're providing in terms of training? I don't think we measure that accurately. How, how do you measure the examples that you're setting and, and maybe the building blocks you're putting into place for that registrar's career, that registrar's well-being, that registrar's ability to be a leader in due course? And we don't measure those things mm -hmm. but we all know mm -hmm. so i'm wondering are are those kind of things measurable it's difficult it, it, it is difficult but there are some really interesting um newer developments uh for instance um emotion in a team i think we'd all sort of agree that a, a, a level of positive emotion in a team facilitates team function and outcomes more than negative emotion. I think that would be a general uh, agreement. And, and we can measure emotion in terms of uh, written analysis of words. Pe what people write down can be analysed for the, the level of emotion. So we can analyse it if we take surveys. Mm -hmm. um, so these sorts of things, but, but making these subjective elements uh, objectively measurable is 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 a really interesting process, I think. And that's something that uh, I'm also trying to do for culture in organisations and teams. Yeah. I think the challenge that, that I foresee there is that, that if we're not careful, what happens is there are certain metrics and then what gets measured gets done. So, you know, if, if there's, if somebody invents, you know, a, a new system and then that becomes the be all and end all and then that's the only thing that we measure and that's the only thing that we focus on and some of the yeah. other stuff that is that is unmeasurable or more difficult to measure or even easy to measure but we choose not to measure it then then that kind of stuff falls by the wayside so um, yeah that's true and, and in a busy in the busy world and the busy lives we have it's hard to give attention to these things because a lot of these things take time don't they it, it probably takes you know how are we going it, even such an open question as that to to assess team dynamics okay so what else do we need to do to create better teams <laughs> well i think the power of the leader is 
is is you know we everyone has their own power and everyone's important but leadership is critical and how we produce leaders is really important and in healthcare oftentimes it seems that the leader is the next most senior person in the team when the leader leaves it's the next oldest uh, person or the the and they may not be the best leader or it's often in a surgical team for instance it's it's the most skilled surgeon that becomes the team leader but they may be a great surgeon but they may not have any leadership ability and sometimes no leadership desire really they don't want to give attention to the junior they might be prefer to be the person who's out in the tea room while you're struggling for two and a half hours um they may be the person that doesn't really want to give cognitive attention to how do I integrate these juniors. They're more interested in their own performance because that's been their focus for 20 years. So how do we assess leadership? Um, who should be the leader without uh, upsetting everyone else or upsetting those people? But I think appointing the right leader uh, is, is, is really important in how you develop your team. And what would you say are the characteristics of a good leader? Well, all those things that we've we've talked about, I think, um, I think being a good person is a pretty good start. Uh, being a good teammate, I think if you can be a good teammate and support your teammates, you probably have the qualities that will become a great leader because you understand relationships, you understand the support we need and how we're all at different points in our lives. And, um, you know, interestingly, um, Jim Collins, the good to great guy, found that uh, the best leaders had a degree of humility, of humbleness, that they weren't the driving uh, tough guys all the time, that, that self-centred. They were more the humble guy who had attention for everyone in the team. They don't have to be the star all the time. Yeah, yeah. and maybe that's back to the Beatles then, aren't we? The... The, who who's the star and sort of who's the who's the humble glue that that brings everything together? What are um what are the advantages for the leader of being a leader? Of, of being the leader, uh, a good leader, you you mean, or just because yeah. I mean obviously, so obviously advantages of lead, but leadership are. A degree of status, uh, possibly remuneration, possibly other things like that. So there is a desire. You know, our society values leaders and uh, we all have an ego. We, we like to be recognised. So I think there's a lot of a lot of things that come with leadership. Um, and I think on that sort of meta level, what are the other advantages of being the great leader that we just talked about? Well, Maybe that satisfaction at the end of your career of knowing how you've influenced people and seeing other people that you've trained becoming leaders. I can't remember whose quote it is, but it's a good one. And it's uh, the main job of a leader is to produce more leaders. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in in you know the the status and the finances because I think in UK contexts. Um, I, I wonder how many people are willing to step up and lead. Um, and um, maybe maybe that's because perhaps there isn't any particular financial or status reward for 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 your average medical leader in UK. And you know maybe it's different in in you know other countries. Um, but that concept of of what difference you're making to others and how you're making changes. I think that strikes me as, as important. Yeah. Um, mm. that, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're a leader because that gives you, that gives you more opportunity to make a difference and it gives you an opportunity to leave a legacy. It gives you an opportunity to make changes. So some of, some of those, you know, partly legacy, but also, you know, if you are the leader that, that gives you the opportunity to implement, changes and that gives you the opportunity to, to make things better um, and if you're not a leader you perhaps wouldn't have those opportunities in the same way yeah and i guess that comes back to your mission the mission of the team the mission of the of the group and the purpose and keeping that in mind so yeah they're all really good points and and i guess all of our mission when we start is to help 
people, isn't it? And then there's so many competing demands and things that sometimes that mission can get a little bit lost. And maybe that when we do get a little bit lost, we have to sort of take a step back and say, what, what is our mission? What are we here for? You know, we're here for the people we're looking after and we're here for our community and we're here for each other as well to, to look after each other. And, um, and, and it's a demanding career medicine. It's a very tough career. Uh, it has its rewards, but the, the demands lead some people to struggle you know and we've talked before about burnout and things like this well we need to look after each other and that's uh that's one of our our roles i think yeah you've um, used the term culture a number of times what what is culture yeah well culture culture is um is really a difficult concept and and we we all talk about it but it, it's it's difficult to define but it's it's kind of a, a, the way things have arisen to enable the work to be done, or in a in an anthropological way, it's it's the most um, persistent and well entrenched features of any society. And in organisational culture, they talk about the three levels of culture, which is is the artefacts, which is what you see in in you. For instance, if you walk into a hospital, you'll see a secretary behind a desk directing people. You'll see tables and chairs. You'll see an outpatient clinic. Um, then there's the espoused values, which is what we say we believe in and how we say we operate. And then there's the sort of under the surface, deeper uh, assumptions. And that's what really goes on. So that's, you know, if we say culture is the way we get things done around here, the assumptions is the way we really get things done around here. So that might be those uh, poorer leaders that, you know, that we're saying all the right things, but you know that if you make a mistake, they're not going to be forgiving and kind and helpful. And yeah, so that that all of that is, is the culture. And culture uh, is something that we can talk about, but it's often something when you walk into an organisation or you become part of a team that you feel and maybe as a junior resident, it's the team you join where after a few days you feel, I'm already part of this team. I'm already belonging. I don't have to pay my dues, you know, do my time, all of those things. You, you, you're a member and you're accepted immediately as a member. And how do cultures change? Cultures change very slowly. Culture change is really difficult. And in organisations, uh, they say that it will take uh, years. For instance, the British Airways culture change took seven years famously. So it's it's something that can be done, but it culture change is also difficult because it's resisted because as humans, we don't like change. We, we kind of fear it because it's unknown. So how, how do we change? I guess... I guess surfacing those assumptions, those hidden things and those difficult things, uh, which might be, for instance, for me, I might say, well, you know what? I'm really not that nice to my residents. I'm really not the leader I, I'm telling myself I am. And, um, and I am when everything's smooth, but when something goes badly, I lash out. And that's so surfacing assumptions can be really painful and difficult yeah. but that honesty and um, willingness to go into difficult places is really the way you will change culture and if somebody is new organization or somebody's been somewhere for a while and thinks i don't like how we work here you know we need to change what what can an individual do to change culture well, I guess what, what, what response they get to those comments will indicate the culture of the organisation they're currently in, that if they say something and then they're really shut down quite quickly or they have to be silenced or they're not listened to, that will indicate a particular type of culture and some difficult aspects. Uh, what can they do? I, I think they have to speak up or talk to their leaders. Um and then the response they get might indicate how enjoyable their current job is or how long they want to stay. And for the organisation that, they, that they're making comment about, how they listen may dictate the quality of their workforce. And 
And this is relevant in healthcare because people are leaving. So being able to listen to new ideas and how we listen to people may improve your human resources. You may not have as many people leaving. You may not have disengaged workers. So it's perhaps as much some people speaking up, but people that are in senior leadership roles, the way that they influence culture is by listening and and encouraging that speaking up and, and taking action and, and being prepared to go to the difficult place for themselves and for the organization. Yeah, yeah, I think so, Matt. And it's not easy, is it? I think we both, even while we're talking about it, we're acknowledging that these are not, it, it sounds easy, but it's not in practice easy to hear. For instance, if someone came and spoke to you about your your healthcare team and had some negative statements, yeah. it, it's difficult to hear that. Um, and our, I think our instinct is to deny or not want to listen, but in hearing it and saying, well, you know, I don't think this is true, but what if it were true? And of course there will be some truth in it because that person's seeing things from a completely different angle to what you are. Yeah. I guess a key thing for me there would be going back to your point, you know, what what's the purpose? What are we here for? Because if the starting point is that we're here for others, we're here to serve, we're here to look after our patients, we're here to look after our team, then if that's the mindset, it it's becomes much easier to, to listen to comments, no matter how painful they, they might be. Um, because you have a vested interest in hearing those things. Because, you know, if I'm here to look after my patients, my team, etc., I need to know those kind of things because that's that's what's going to enable me to look after them as best as yes. I can. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And that courage to to say that and listen is uh, is going to create a very strong team, I think. Maybe I'll bring us to a close, Simon. So what would be your top tips for doctors at work? Um, well, I think uh, many of us are familiar with the Harvard study on ageing, that um, the key to happiness and well-being throughout life is relationships. And I'm interested that you said, Matt, that you're still in touch with those older consultants from many years ago. So you still have relationships with those, and that's probably a very nourishing and really great part of your life. And I, so I think attend to our relationships you know, we all want friends. So to have friends be a good friend, I think concentrate on our relationships as we're progressing through medicine from day one. And I think our work lives and our home lives and our the whole of our life will be more enjoyable. That's a great tip. Thank you very much, Simon. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.